that better? Okay, yes. Uh, is the mic on? Okay. <clears throat> well, this is uh, more of a technical talk, uh, but partly inspired by uh, the fact that UFO reports frequently uh, discuss impressive maneuverability at, with uh, usually no indication of uh, conventionally known drives. And uh, to cut to the chase, just in case I should run out of time, a, uh, a sufficiently advanced technology can use antimatter annihilation to power a reaction drive whose only exhaust is an intense beam of neutrinos. Um, this would not be visible. It would be very hard to detect by any means, uh, but it is potentially a testable hypothesis from res retrospective evidence that uh, already exists. Um, just as a note, by a sufficiently advanced technology, I uh, mean something that can accomplish anything that can be know that is known to be physically possible, uh, but that does not require any new physics simply uh, on the grounds that uh, I felt that a hypothesis is uh, more credible if it sticks to things that we know are possible in principle. Um, now, there's been a fair amount of uh, discussion about uh, theoretical space propulsion. At the moment, the only physics we know of relevant to space propulsion involves a law of equal action and reaction. The only way you can move in one direction is to throw something else, reaction mass as I call it, uh, in the other direction. Uh, there are some variations uh, that basically involve getting your reaction mass from outside the vehicle, but they still adhere to Newton's third law. And the most powerful known reaction drive is an antimatter rocket. Um, I, I, I was told after I submitted my abstract that it would be good to uh, provide a brief primer on, on what antimatter is to begin with. So every type of particle making up normal matter has a corresponding antiparticle. Um, the relation between antimatter and normal matter is that uh, every measurable property is either identical or exactly the opposite between the two. Mass is one of the identical properties. Antimatter particles have the same mass as matter particles. Electrical charge is one of the reversed properties. The anti-electron is also called the positron because it has a positive charge. The anti-proton has a negative charge. When matter and antimatter meet, they annihilate, releasing energy. And just historically, the first antiparticle discovered was the anti-electron or positron. Okay. Now, electron-positron annihilation is nice and simple. They simply meet each other and convert into a pair of gamma rays carrying all of the energy. Uh, now, in accelerators, we've been studying antiprotons for decades now. Their annihilation is more complicated, partly because a proton is a composite object made of three quarks. An antiproton, of course, is made of three antiquarks. And partly because the energy release is so much bigger that completely new particles, or rather particle-antiparticle pairs, can be created out of the energy. This is a reversible process, but there is no material particle lighter than the electron, so there's no alternative but photons here. The primary annihilation gives you a mess of uh, unstable reaction products that ultimately are all going to decay or mutually annihilate into photons and neutrinos. Um, the, uh, now, if a single antiproton annihilates inside a large nucleus, uh, most of the intermediate products are strongly act interacting mesons, which are very efficient at transferring energy to the rest of the nucleus. So most Aside from photons, most of the energy appears as thermal excitation in a nucleus that's literally been blown apart by the excess energy. However, if an antiproton annihilates an isolated proton, the uh, 
ultimate products all break down into photons and neutrinos, and the neutrinos end up with the lion's share of the energy uh, for technical reasons that I can get into later on if anybody's really interested. Now, for a reaction drive, the faster you throw away your reaction mass, the more efficient your drive is, the more thrust you get per unit of fuel you're using up. The ultimate reaction drive would have an exhaust velocity equal to the speed of light. Now since, uh, which essentially amounts to turning your fuel mass into radiation and beaming it out the back. Um, you might think that you can do that with uh, antimatter since it annihilates matter completely into energy, except that the aforementioned neutrino problem, the neutrinos fly off in all directions equally. You can't direct them, you can't manipulate them. Uh, so much of the energy is lost in terms of neutrinos that a, a rich mi mix antimatter rocket would actually be terribly inefficient. But that assumes you're just burning the matter-antimatter mix in a reaction chamber. Uh, the trick is to pre-accelerate the particles you're going to annihilate. Uh, as in a particle accelerator on Earth, you accelerate both the proton and the antiproton to high speed, but in the same direction, not ramming them into each other the way we do for experiments. They annihilate in, at high speed. The reaction products inherit that center of mass motion, and then you put in a retrieval stage. The stuff that you can interact with, you capture, reprocess the energy, use it to power the acceleration for the next particle pair. Meanwhile, the neutrinos escape. All of the momentum that has been put into them by the pre-acceleration is just carried out of the chamber, and you get a net thrust. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip quickly over the math here. It, we can refer to it in question and answer if people really want. Um, but this uh, graphic illustrates the uh, drive attributes in a perhaps somewhat more accessible way. Down here at the bottom, I've uh, plotted the fraction of retrievable energy, the amount of uh, annihilation energy that can be captured and used. And that actually depends on how big your engine is and how much free path you have for intermediate reaction products to decay. If something is still a pion of some sort, you can intercept it and use it. It will decay naturally into neutrinos and photons, and uh, that, that's, that's where those neutrinos come from. It's a process that takes time um, and uh, requires a certain amount of free path to be completed. Um, now, Fortunately, the math on the previous page indicates that the higher the mass retention, that is, the fewer neutrino decays you allow, the higher your effective exhaust velocity, the amount of thrust you get per unit of fuel. Um, th this is a good thing because that means that the smaller your engine, the more powerful and efficient it can be. Um, just for comparison, a, uh, a lean mix antimatter rocket where you're uh, doing simple uh, a burning like effect and have perhaps 5% antimatter would have about this thrust to mass ratio. An ideal fusion rocket would be down here. An ideal fission rocket would be down here. And the chemical rockets that we're actually building nowadays would be so far down into the corner that there's no room for the font. Um, <clears throat> now, what that means in terms of the performance of such a drive system, if, oh, sorry, I overshot. Uh, this shaded area here shows the approximate regime for an engine of reasonable size a few meters across, and you can see that our effective exhaust velocity is indeed very close to the ultimate possible limit. Uh, a vehicle with a, a drive of this type, if it made a constant 1G thrust trip from the moon to the Earth, it would use up uh, 0.42 kilograms of fuel mass 
for each metric ton of vehicle mass. That's about one pound of fuel an eighth of